think we've got most everybody in here that wants to be here. If, if for some reason you get thirsty and you want to go out and get another glass of wine, we've got a live feed out in the, in the area out that you're just standing in. So, you know, you can see the whole thing out there remotely if you'd like. Uh, first of all, I want to say welcome. My name is Rusty Metter. I'm the president of the Bernie Public Library Foundation. And uh, we are so excited to have you here tonight. This is, this is a big day for Bernie. Uh, this is something that we've been dreaming about for some time and this and it's one of those kind of things that just didn't happen uh it took a lot of planning and it took a lot of effort and it took a little bit of luck too because you know you've heard that the, the theory of six degrees of separation well you'll hear how that kind of evolves here in a little bit as we get into the program this evening about how somebody from Bernie knew somebody that was on the board of the, of the yellowstone library uh, the yellowstone library the yellowstone Park Foundation, and then all of a sudden there was this idea, well, maybe we could get the Yellowstone Park to come to Bernie. And sure enough, we did. And uh, there was a lot of people that were involved in that. Uh, first of all, I just want to say on behalf of the, of the, of the Bernie Public Library Foundation, the Yellowstone Park Foundation, uh, the Patrick Heath Public Library, the city of Bernie, and Kendall County, we're just so excited to have you here. First of all, I can see a show of hands. How many of you are not from Kendall County? And we got people from, look at here. That's great. That's great. Well, we're welcome. We're, we are so excited for you to be here. Yeah, you can start around the applause. We came the farthest, probably. So, uh, we appreciate you being here and, and to experience a little bit of, of, of the Yellowstone Park right here in Bernie County. Uh, the other thing I'd like to ask, just real quick, show of hands, how many of you have been to Yellowstone Park? Look at there. Turn around and look. <laughs> it's a bunch. But those of you that haven't, we're going to, by the time you're through with this evening, you're, you'll be buying your tickets. <laughs> but like I said, this doesn't just happen. It takes a lot. There's, there's a tremendous number of people who volunteered for this, for this program to put this together tonight, not only tonight, but as many of you know, uh, starting tomorrow, this exhibit will be here until August 15th. So it's, what you're here for tonight is Yellowstone Park through the seasons, and we'll tell you a little bit more about that. But what, what starts tomorrow is the Yellowstone Summer, and it will be a complete program and includes reading programs for children to adults, uh, all kinds of a variety of different programs that are going to be uh, good. If you have kids, this is a good place to keep them occupied. So uh, hopefully you'll check into those programs. There's brochures and information out uh, in, in the area outside that uh, can give you more information on that. Uh, I want to thank uh, also my the board members, the people of the Bernie Public Library Foundation. Uh, these guys and gals have worked tirelessly to get this not only tonight going, but the rest of the, the rest of the summer as well. And I just want to, if you're a, if you're a, a board member, would you please stand up and be recognized, please? Yeah. And I also want to thank two special people that, uh, without whose help, this would not happen. And that's uh, Ariel Brooks Stevens. I don't know where Ariel is. If she's in the room, she's probably outside uh, working. And Meg Sam, who, who works with Ariel, uh, without their help, we couldn't have put this together. So, I'd also like to say a big thank you to Celeste Walt. Celeste, would you stand up, please? I know you hate me. This is part of that. Uh, Six degree of separation, and I'll, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go into the program here. Uh, the, other, the other important people that I would like to thank are, of course, our sponsors. And again, without them, uh, this would not be possible. And I want to recognize them tonight as well. Uh, that is Frost Bank, Bernie Collision, Ritterman Plumbing, Wells Fargo Bank, Annette Nickel, uh, Tap the Tapatia Ladies Club, Lynn Richter, and my wife Dawn and I. So we thank all of you for your participation. Let's give them a round of applause. Yeah. Well, now at this point, I want to turn the program over uh, to a lady I just met, actually. Uh, she had a long drive today. She'll probably tell you a little bit about that you know, once she gets up here. But uh, I, want to, I want to introduce Kay Yeager, who is currently the chairman of the board of the Yellowstone Park Foundation. And Kay also serves, Kay is a busy lady. Uh, I want you to know, she is, serves as chairman of the Shepherd Military Affairs Committee. She's chairman of the Board of Presbyterian Manor and the Presbyterian Manor Foundation, and chairman of the trustees and foundation of the First Methodist Church. Uh, she serves as an alumnus member and mentor of the Air Force Chief of Staff Civic Leaders Group, 
a group comprised of men and women representing the major commands of the Air Force, the executive board of the Perkins School of Theology at Southern Methodist University, go Mustangs, <laughs> and is one of the three co-chairs of Theology School, School's SMU Unbridled uh, Capital Campaign. Kay also serves on the board and executive committee of the Texas Methodist Foundation and the board of Southwestern University in Georgetown, Texas. She was formerly mayor of Wichita Falls, chairman of the Board of Regents of Midwestern State University in Wichita Falls, and chairman of the Wichita Falls, Wichita County Multipurpose Event Center from its inception. I don't know what she does on her off time. <laughs> I don't think she has it. Would you please give a, a warm, burning welcome to Kay Yeager. Great to be here representing Yellowstone Park Foundation and Yellowstone National Park. Um, and I'd like to just thank everybody here who is what a magnificent building this is, first of all, and how well it fits into its uh, the landscape around it. It's just marvelous. And to go around and see the sprinkling of Yellowstone throughout the building is really pretty cool. So, Right now, you ask what I do in my private time. My husband had a knee replacement, so I'm attempting to play nurse general. <laughs> but I'm delighted, anyway, to be here, and I just want to do it. Since we've been asked this by almost everybody that we've talked to tonight, to say that the Yellowstone Park Foundation Board is a national board. Yellowstone National Park is the nation's, the country's first park. In fact, it's the world's first park. So the board is comprised of members from all over the United States, and we have Richard and Nancy Severance here with us tonight. Richard's on the board, and Nancy's here wherever they are. I can't see them, but they live in Wimberley, and we're delighted that they drove over to be here with us too. The Yellowstone Park Foundation is the uh, Yellowstone National Park's sole fundraiser. We were have been in existence for 15 years. This is our 16th year last year. We celebrated our 15th anniversary by going around the country and having uh, gatherings in a lot of different places and trying to get the message out about Yellowstone National Park and its needs in the private sector for support and about how the Yellowstone Park Foundation does support the National Park. Since 1996, we have raised over $70 million for the Yellowstone Park. And we um, try to keep our expenses as low as possible and give the money to the park. And I think, quite frankly, as the government tightens up on its budget and stays there, um, the park's uh, budget has actually decreased in the last two or three years, that the need for private funding to provide the margin of excellence that the nation's first park uh, demands will become even greater. So, that's our mission and goal, so we'll have to do from that. We raised the money and we have funded over 260 priority projects for the park. <coughs> we do not fund maintenance, upkeep, or operational things, but items and projects that will provide that margin of excellence in the park and raise it above the other national parks in the country. We do this under uh, six strategic initiatives, wildlife and wonders, Vista Experience, Cultural tre Treasures, Ranger Heritage, Damara Stewards, and the Greenest Park. And we try to cover, you know, really the whole gamut of the park and through these six strategic initiatives. We are here tonight to help you all celebrate the launch of the Patrick Heath Public Library's Yellowstone Summer and to mark a unique partnership between two organizations uh, focused on creating lifelong stewards of learning and also of Yellowstone. Many of you all know Patrick Keith, however you may not know of his family connection to Yellowstone. Patrick's daughter and son-in-law Jennifer and Tom Porter, both here tonight, have spent 20 years living and working in and near Yellowstone. Tom serves as corporate relations manager for the Yellowstone Park Foundation. Thanks to Patrick, Tom Porter met Bernie Public Library Foundation member, board member Celeste Wall, whose brother Bruce happened to serve on our advisory council at one point. 
Needless to say, there was a mutual love of Yellowstone and an interest to raise awareness about what makes Yellowstone so special. The two organizations worked together to create Yellowstone reading lists and to provide access to the park's archives. And you'll see items out of the park archives throughout the building. Uh, the source of many of the subjects and artifacts found. At this time, I would like to introduce Karen Bates Kress, who is the president of the Yellowstone Park Foundation. Can you hear me? Good. Um, I'm very pleased to be here tonight as part of this partnership, representing part of it. And I want to thank all of you for coming and hearing a little more, seeing a little more about Yellowstone National Park. We love being able to bring Yellowstone to different communities around the country. I also want to thank Celeste Wall and Tom Porter of the Yellowstone Park Foundation staff the members of the um, Bernie Public Library Foundation, and um, Ariel, who I met this afternoon, who was executive director of the foundation, Rusty Matter, who just spoke, and also Kelly Scofberg, who is the library director, who worked very closely with park staff as well as our foundation staff to make this happen. So again, like I said, we're thrilled to be here. I was really struck by the fact as Kay was saying, that we are the official fundraising partner for Yellowstone National Park. And we have a, clearly a very strong public-private partnership. We work very closely with a federal agency, the National Park Service. And I was struck by the fact that clearly the same thing has been happening in Bernie. The city of Bernie working very closely with the Bernie Public Library Foundation. And I am sure that without philanthropy, this building would not be as great as it is. Just like many of the things that we have done for Yellowstone National Park without philanthropy, they just wouldn't happen. And um, for instance, I'll just mention briefly that philanthropy in the parks has been around for a very long time. From early on in 1907, uh, Mr. and Mrs. William Kent uh, donated the land from Muir Woods just north of uh, San Francisco. And that was in 1907. Then, of course, we have the Rockefellers, the Mellons, the Mathers, doing all kinds of uh, creating parks and helping to fund parks. The Rockefellers funded four trailside museums in the late 20s, early 30s uh, in Yellowstone, and even in much more than that. Um, so again, I know the same things happened with um, Bernie, is that, uh, did I turn this off? No. <laughs> that, uh, New York City, I remember years ago, had a hundreds of million dollar campaign for their New York City public library. So whether it's parks, whether it's libraries, there are these public-private public partnerships that are really strong around the country. So for us, it's not a matter of you know, people giving millions of dollars. We have donors who give $10. And we're very, very happy to have all stewards of Yellowstone, whether it's $15, $150, 15000 million and a half. We're happy to do whatever we can. And I'm sure the Library Foundation is feeling the same thing. So with that, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing another board member of Yellowstone Park Foundation, world-renowned wildlife and nature photographer Tom Murphy. Tom spends about 100 days every year in Yellowstone National Park. And his work and love of the park is evident in the images and his continuing generosity to the Yellowstone Park Foundation and thereby Yellowstone National Park. He has been published um, both editorially and commercially in numerous publications. There's such a long list, I have to read this. Uh, Life Magazine, Architectural Digest, National Geographic, Audubon, Time, Newsweek, New York Times, National Geographic Adventure, Esquire, and others. You'll love this one. He was Cameron Diaz's guide in Yellowstone for an MTV project. <laughs> Look at he's like, oh, talk to me here. <laughs> and he photographed for Meredith Brokaw's cookbook, Big Sky Cooking. 
Tom has published several books of Yellowstone photography, most recently the fourth and final book in his Seasons of Yellowstone series, The Spirit of Winter. Tom and his wife Bonnie live in Livingston, Montana, which is only about 50 miles from the park. So with that, I will um, welcome Tom Murphy. Park. 
Uh, she's in several photographs in, in the display out there. Uh, and she was a wonderful bear. Uh, she got very used to people. Uh, she'd come and lick the bugs off the headlight of your car. <laughs> but she never bothered anybody. And uh, I loved, <clears throat> loved her like everybody else did. And uh, uh, I missed the shot right after this. She played with her toes and flew around. And she lost her balance and flipped over backwards, and I was laughing and stuff. <laughs> <clears throat> Again, I'm trying to tell a story about what these animals' life is like. Um, this was, according to the thermometer, it was 38 below zero. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> after a couple hours, I looked like these bison <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> waited for a long time until the light got right. But uh, <clears throat> again, that's what it's like to live in Yellowstone in the wintertime sometimes. <clears throat> um, the title for this is uh, Tom Who? <laughs> great, great album. I photograph wildlife, watch them, sometimes they watch me as well. <laughs> Can we kill the rest of these lights? <clears throat> um, sometimes they don't seem to like me around. And my goal is uh, not to upset them, not to disturb them. Uh, so if they look like this when I leave, I think I'm pretty, pretty well left them alone. And, uh, <clears throat> and this, uh, again, a bull elk. <clears throat> he was eating the flowers, I just timed it just before he took a bite out. Uh, I look like that in the morning sometimes. <laughs> Bad hair day for a baldy. Again, coyote telling the story about what their life is like. This is a brown lizard in Lamar Valley, my favorite part of Yellowstone, uh, <clears throat> struggling along in that uh, what a 30 mile an hour wind. Uh, through the sagebrush flats. <clears throat> this is a Yellowstone cutthroat trout. Uh, <clears throat> I can't swim. I grew up on a prairie in South Dakota and the water was generally only about two feet deep. Uh, <clears throat> so this is about two feet of water. Uh, in a project for National Geographic, uh, it was a fancy $20,000 underwater camera. Uh, problem was I had to give the camera back. <laughs> <clears throat> This qualifies Yellowstone as a national park all by itself, I believe. This is the lower falls of the Yellowstone, the Grand Canyon of Yellowstone. Uh, 309 feet tall, about a thousand foot deep canyon in places. Uh, just absolutely gorgeous place. This is what it looks like in the summertime. This is what it looks like in the wintertime. You can sort of judge the severity of the winter by the size of that ice cone at the base of the falls. Come from the mist falling or <clears throat> being thrashed around there at the base of the falls. So you're looking at about 150, 175 feet of ice, uh, pretty much a normal winter. <clears throat> this is like <coughs> Hayden Valley in the wintertime. Uh, it uh, looks radically different than it does in the summertime. It's another park entirely in the winter. <clears throat> this is my favorite part of Yellowstone. Again, I'll mention that several times. This is Lamar Valley. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, for the Wolf Reintroduction Project. They put the wolves back in different parts of Lamar. And uh, the east boundary of the park is on those mountains off to the far left side. <clears throat> it's the peak uh, near Mammoth in the northwest corner of the park uh, before sunrise. Uh, it's called Alpen Go. That peak is Electric Peak. Uh, <clears throat> I skied at the top of that one time. Uh, most people ski down mountains. I ski up them. Uh, but if you stand, when I stood on the top of the peak, put my hand in the air, I touched 11,000 feet. <laughs> Electric Peak in the fall, early morning. This is a phenomenon called diamond dust. Uh, little sparkles uh, scattered throughout the uh, forest here. And it's uh, about 20 below zero. What's happening is the clear blue sky and what's the humidity in the air is freezing and forming these tiny, tiny little ice crystals. And they just float all around you. You think you're imagining them first. Beautiful magic stuff. And we get some wind there. This is uh, across the Hayden Valley. <clears throat> Mammoth Hot Springs. Uh, it's not a geyser area. It's a, a feature, a geothermal feature, uh, producing this rock called travertine, redeposited limestone. A lot of times people see this place as, as a kid and they come back and they say it's all dried up. Uh, actually, it's about the same. Uh, it just moves in different places. And <clears throat> the researchers say, that this produces 
uh, deposits about 50 tons of rock a day to this complex. Uh, so it's going to change literally every day. Morning stuff, steam coming out of, of the hot springs at Mammoth. <clears throat> One of the features of a Canary Spring, uh, and this now under, this is about a 20 year old photograph. It's probably under about 30 feet of rock, this stuff here. <clears throat> this is Angel Terrace, top of Mammoth. It's a feature in uh, the Upper Geyser Basin near Old Faithful called Doublet Pool. Uh, and uh, scalloped edges here. This is not travertine rock. This is a sinter or a, cal uh, a uh, silicate deposit. Much slower deposition. It probably takes 100 years to build an inch of this stuff. <clears throat> this is a geyser called Castle Geyser. Um, <clears throat> and it's the full moon there, that little spot on the right side. And a lot of times people squint their eyes and look at me and say, did you use Photoshop to do this? Uh, <clears throat> I don't do much with Photoshop. This is uh, a pink geyser because there was this giant pink cloud above me to the west, behind me in the sunset. And uh, so it lit the whole landscape with this pink light. That's what it looks like normal light without the pink cloud. Uh, I'd like to drag a pink cloud around more often, but it's hard to capture. Geyser Basin steam from Old Faithful. Another geyser uh, complex there called Lion Geyser Complex. That's Lion Geyser going off there. And the feature in the foreground is called Heart Spring. And this is one of the most famous features in the world, Old Faithful Geyser. Uh, it's not the most faithful, it's not the biggest, it's not the prettiest, but it's got a great PR person. <laughs> most people know about it. Uh, this is right at sunrise, back with uh, in the wintertime, I love it in the wintertime because you get a lot more frost and steam. <clears throat> this is what it looks like under a full moon or almost full moon. The geyser in the lower geyser basin called Clepsidra geyser. This one erupts constantly, 24 hours a day, uh, about 30, 40 feet in the air. Well, Faithful goes about 150 feet in the air. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite little ones I like to have in my yard. It's called Sawmill Geyser. And it's, it's a, called a fountain type geyser, which means it punches up through a pool of water. And it comes up and spirals this water about as high as this panel above us and uh, spins it out like sawdust off a sawmill blade. Um, <clears throat> Yellowstone Park Foundation um, basically built the Old Faithful Visitor Center. I'm going to give them all the credit we can. Um, and uh, about eight years ago, the Park Service called me and asked me if they could use a couple of my photographs for the visitor center. And I said, yeah, I have to use all of them. So most of the photography in the visitor center is mine. And uh, some of the stuff I didn't have. So this is, the Park Service put me in their helicopter to shoot some of this, some aerial stuff. So this is in a high altitude Alouette uh, helicopter. <clears throat> Took the left door off where I'm sitting. The pilot's over on the right side where he's supposed to be. And, uh, and so flying along here, I got buckled in, and I'd start to <coughs> photograph, and the pilot would tip it on its side and spin in circles <coughs> while I'm shooting out the door. Uh, so this is the lower geyser basin. The Clepsidra geyser is that column of steam on the upper left. This is the Midway geyser basin. Uh, there's two absolutely spectacular features. The top one is Grand Prismatic Spring, and the bottom is Excelsior geyser crater. <coughs> This is right above Grand Prismatic Springs. The scale, you can see the boardwalk on the left, that line, and there's little tiny things there are people. And uh, <clears throat> so this is me spinning above them, and I've uh, been up about an hour doing different things. <clears throat> I need to go get some fuel, so I'm doing pretty well until he flattened out to fly to Grant, and then I threw up off the side of the house. <laughs> uh, bison bull swimming in the Yellowstone River. Again, I love bison. They're one of my favorite creatures here. He is decorating a field of dandelions. Colony calf taking a drink at sunset. It's a big bull drinking uh, in the winter time. Very tough animals. This uh, <clears throat> is up on Swan Lake Flat, in about a 30, 40 mile an hour blizzard wind. My left ear filled up with snow after about 10 minutes. And these guys were just lying there like it was a summer day chewing their cuts. <laughs> Upper geyser basin, they hang around the thermals uh, and as much as they can in the wintertime. Uh, they're just trying to stay warm. 
Another one up near Crested Pool doing the same thing, basically a sauna, um, <clears throat> standing there absorbing as much of the heat as you can. Now sometimes it takes a couple of series of photographs to tell the complete story, but uh, these are a couple of elk cows. This is in June in Yellowstone, believe it or not, if you have snow. And there's, they have calves, <clears throat> and so they're kind of keeping an eye on on what's going on, what may be threatening their little calves, so they're kind of looking in all directions to see. <laughs> make sure that they're not. <laughs> this is a, a bull elk uh, in June, uh, and they're growing their antlers. They start in, in early April, and they grow them in about two and a half months. Uh, so this is a, a relatively soft, uh, full of blood, and covered with velvet or a, a real fine hair. So it's just back with fuzziness on their antlers. So what they look like when they uh, have rubbed that velvet off and hard, hardened the antlers. And this is in September, October during that rut, the mating season. Absolutely gorgeous sound. They don't sound like a big macho bull. Uh, they sound more like a, a brass whistle. This is another bull elk. Uh, this guy's not making any noise at all. They also do this during the rut. It's a behavior called Fleming. Uh, it's part of the uh, mating stuff. They're tasting elk urine, female urine to see if she's in heat. Uh, towards the end of the winter one year, uh, this guy was really hungry, so his antlers beat up, um, and uh, he was acting like a moose, basically eating on stuff underwater, which they don't normally do. Again, Lamar, um, some cow elk moving down the, the valley. And they spar year round, except when they don't, when they have those soft antlers, uh, tapping their antlers together, pushing and carrying on, and uh, basically just kind of keeping track of who's the toughest. Mm -hmm. Now, moose is another deer family that member that lives in Yellowstone. Uh, these are a couple of bulls, uh, also in June in Yellowstone. Um, again, velvet on their antlers, too. The cow moose, uh, her little calf there behind her is about 10 hours old. And uh, little lobby legs trying to keep up with mom out there in the water. Um, these are hard to arrange to get them at the end of a rainbow. But <laughs> some of my relatives have a name or a law named after them, which I don't subscribe to Murphy's Law. <laughs> but, I have Murphy's Luck. Waiting along the shore of uh, Yellowstone Lake. This one out in the lobby here. Uh, the story of this you maybe read this placard, but uh, this was after sunset and uh, this moose was feeding underwater aquatic vegetation, and of course his whole head was underwater at times. And he'd pull his head out and let the water run out of his nose and hold really still. So I shot a picture just when he was still, otherwise it was just a blur. <clears throat> Big one sheep. You guys going for coffee in the morning? <laughs> Again, rainbows and little animals kind of work for me. This is a pronghorn in the lower right corner there. Uh, <clears throat> wonderful creature. Um, the only ungulate that's uh, indigenous just to North America. Uh, the second fastest land animal in the world. Uh, the only animal that can run faster than this is the African cheetah. I think, well, what's that got to do with pronghorns? Well, there used to be an American cheetah, uh, and a short-faced bear, and a dire wolf, and a couple other animals that could outrun a pronghorn animal. They all went extinct. This guy is still left, and he's got some residual speed. And when this little baby pronghorn animal, probably about two days old, um, they're about this tall, legs about the size of your little finger, and they can just zip along. They look like they're flying with no legs. Of course, Yellowstone's famous for bears, uh, and uh, 30, 40 years ago, we used to feed them alongside the road, but uh, they don't do that anymore, fortunately. Uh, much better situation for everybody. This is a black bear uh, in the fall. This is also a little black bear uh, cub in the fall in a white bark pine tree. And, uh, he was way up there, about 80 feet off the ground up there, going after these cones. White bark pine cones have a nut inside them. It's like a pinion pine nut. It tastes really good. You make pesto out of those. Um, and uh, so he was way up there, these little branches swaying back and forth, 
eating these things. The smart guys were on the ground waiting for them to drop. <laughs> <laughs> this is upstairs. This we printed this. This is 264, that same bear we saw at the beginning playing with her toes. Um, and she's in the middle, and this is her third set of cubs, two and a half year old at the time. If you look closely on her left front foot, she's got her paw on the back of a dead bison, bison cow. See under her armpit, um, there's a nose of the carpet, so that can help for the bison cow. <clears throat> Just as an aside, you might notice there's some dishes out there that were made from some of my photographs. They made a big platter out of this photograph, and I decided, <clears throat> again, I don't normally do Photoshop, but I decided people wouldn't want to eat off a dead bison, so I, <laughs> so I photoshopped it and smushed this around me. It looked like rock. <laughs> this is a little Buddha. <laughs> Now, this is a grizzly bear that had no intention of photographing. Uh, it was August, uh, a fellow who used to live in both, or had a house in Livingston, from Brooklyn, and uh, met him at a party one time, and he said he didn't care for Yellowstone Park, because all he saw was Winnebago bumpers. I said, well, you need to get off the road, first of all. Uh, so anyway, so I took him for a hike. <clears throat> so this is in Hayden Valley, and uh, we're about three miles off the road early morning, <clears throat> and in August, during the bison rut, and uh, so we're walking along, and there's a herd of bison in your life. Having a great time, and walk over this little ridge, and here's this dead bison bull. And uh, about 60 yards away from us, in bear country, you never go to a carcass, unless there's 64 of you. Um, so I wasn't, didn't see any bears. So I talked to Bob, and he's from Brooklyn, and he wasn't real good with binoculars, so he was kind of looking around, trying to, <laughs> trying to find this thing with binoculars. And, <clears throat> And I speculated probably was this bull was probably killed by another bull. They fight and sometimes they gore each other and kill each other. And whatever. So I <clears throat> talked a little bit and then I went to the right about three steps and and in the belly of this bison, this grizzly bear's head pops up. Well, fortunately she was looking into the belly of the bison. She didn't see us. I said, Bob, we gotta get out of here. So he gets his binoculars and say, No, Bob, I gotta get out of here. <clears throat> and we're only 